Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Glad to see everybody here. Um, so we're going to start today. We're going to talk uh, a little bit about what cost and, and uh, is in the build um, package in the ACC. And then I'm going to do my version of demystification from a text point of view is um, not high level. I'm going to get into the granular bits. We're going to start a project. We're going to talk about project templates. Um, I'm hoping to really uh, allow everybody uh, to see the real process uh, of going through all of this. So um, I'm going to start. Um, you know, so we were going to have a brief intro, uh, then my demo. We're going to have a little bit of a chat about ERP sync, uh, and I'll get into that shortly, and hopefully some time for some Q&A if there is any. So let's get started here. Uh, the Construction Cloud, if you have heard of it, if you're not quite sure what it entails, it is um, a unified platform. So Autodesk has sort of been pulling together tech from um, various platforms, and we've got it all into one place right now. And we are um, we're looking at basically the, the main platform is Docs. Docs is a kind of like a file transfer, uh, Google Docs, you know, OneDrive, except it's specifically geared at Autodesk and the construction industry. So when you get a PDF up there, you can uh, you can do markups on it. You can start issues on it. You can um, share those markups with your team. When you get um, DWGs or Revit files, right? If you get models up there and actual drawings, you can interact with those drawings. You can't um, necessarily edit them, but you can review them. You can turn layers and, and uh, categories on and off. You can like fully measure, section, and review a document in there. So it, it really um, is another level of, of cloud storage, um, as well as uh, you know, lower level PM functions, reviewing issues, um, document reviews, transmittals, and so on. So we're not going to get into a lot of that today, but that's the general idea. That's the basis on which all of the other platforms are formed. And so if you get, let's say, one of these later platforms, you'll always get docs included in everything. Um, if you're on the design side, so you're an architect or an engineer, you may be using the Collaborate and the Collaborate Pro modules. That allows you to open a file in Revit that is being stored in the cloud, a work shared model that's being stored in the cloud, and you're going to um, you're going to work on it locally, just like your normal uh, workflow might have been before you went to the cloud. And this is going to make sure that all of your um, documentation is in the cloud. It's going to be your single source of truth. That's your most up-to-date model. It's going to make it easier to coordinate and share that model with other um, disciplines and professionals inside of that cloud system. So, um, you know, no more trying to email with we transfer a three gigabyte model or something like that. Um, next, we have Takeoff. So this is a quantification tool for 2D and 3D. And all of these, you know, Takeoff and Build especially, they will build on, no pun intended, the Collaborate uh, Pro information. That Those models that you are, uh, you know, accessing via the design side of things, they can get pushed forward, the, uh, the sheets, um, the documents that are getting published at that, those earlier levels. We can use those now in takeoff. We can use the, the accurate latest model um, to do our quantification inside of the cloud. Um, and so that's, you know, a fantastic tool there. And then we have build and cost. So cost is what I'm going to be focusing on here. Mark uh, Petrucci is, is on the line with us. He's got a bit of build information that he's going to throw in wherever I need it. And um, so it's generally build as a project management system and cost comes with build. It's, it's one module that you would buy, but if, you know, feels like two and um, cost is the, the financial project management of that side of things. So it's going to track your costs. Anytime there's a money associated with something that might've even happened in build, uh, we're going to take that forward. Like, um, um, sorry, PCOs, change orders, all of that. That's going to be what we track the costs for on the cost side. So this is where I'm going to turn it over to um, Mark for a quick summary on build. 
Yep. So, hey, everyone. So, yep. As Emily said, build is typically used when you're managing projects. Um, most of the time, build is used by, you know, your field personnel, project managers, project engineers, uh, general contractors, uh, also subcontractors. And, you know, in, in the past couple of years, I've also trained um, architects, engineers, how to use build to help them manage RFIs as well. Um, the beauty with build is it ties into the to, to the entire construction cloud. And so you can see, you know, docs is included with it. Um, that's that is the tool that connects everything together. But what's really nice about some of the other features of build, such as your forms, your RFIs, submittals and photos, um, you know, things that we typically do on the construction site, things that we have to manage, fill out or record. Um, the issue tracking, that happens everywhere from design all the way through construction, so, uh, pre-con and construction. Um, the meeting tracker and correspondence, um, those are like one of the younger products to build, but they've been out for a couple of years. And those are those are products that are very useful for uh, creating your meeting agenda, tracking your meeting minutes, and then using the correspondence tool to track all of your emails related to the project. And then finally, the asset tracking and also part of asset tracking is progress tracking, um, tracking assets of, of your project, which could be any component of the building. It could be equipment. It could be fixtures. It could be your doors and windows. Um, everything that I've uh, I've covered there, you know, has some sort of cost associated with it. And then finally, there's a construction schedule and we know how important schedules are to the to the site. Um, you know, with build, we can have live schedules. I can have people go in there, review the schedule, uh, filter and sort it however they want, as opposed to getting a PDF or an image of a schedule. They can actually we can import a Microsoft project or a Primavera schedule and then we can edit it and look at it any which way. But as I said, everything in there pretty much has some sort of a cost implementation implementation. And so implement. Yeah, whatever. It, it has an effect. Uh, so we need cost uh, to tie into that. And that most of those uh, items that you see listed there, usually we're talking about potential change orders. And so potential change orders is the link between your build RFIs, your build issues, your, your build meeting uh, items. Generating a potential change order from build will automatically apply whatever we need to on the build side, apply that directly inside of Autodesk cost. Great, thank you. Um, sure. So now on the cost side, Mark mentioned all of that ability to to create um, basically PCOs from our multiple different elements in there. Uh, I'm not going to try and <laughs> recreate that, um, but that is a big. Uh, I don't know. It's a really nice transfer of information um, uh, going forward. So on the cost side, then you know who's using this everybody, right? GCs, uh, project managers are going to be the ones really into the system. Um, uh, subs, of course, are going to be in there. Uh, I highlighted here, not accounting. Now, we're, we in the construction industry are trying to take people out of their silos and be able to share data more. But um, ask an accountant if they want their project managers in their system, and they're going to, that's a big no. So what we're trying to do here is um, allow the project managers their control over a, a project level um, construction budget without having to deal with the accounting stuff that they don't know about, right? So we are trying to actually <laughs> sort of keep them siloed. Um, but my last point here actually deals with uh, the integration of that data. Even though we're, we've kind of pulled it apart, um, in this case, we want it to come back together at the end. So I'll, I'll get there. So again, it includes docs, right? So anything that we generate uh, as far as documentation and costs is gonna get you know, stashed somewhere on the docs side of things. We have, um, we're gonna create a budget and be able to track that budget and we're gonna create a main contract um, and, and payment, um, um, payment applications, right, upstream or downstream, right, to your owner or your GC or whoever is upstream of you um, or downstream, uh, your subs uh, or, again, your GC, whoever is downstream, wherever you are sitting in that um, workflow. We've got change orders, which is where we can bring information forward in the form of PCOs from um, build. Forecast and progress tracking, this is... Um, Again, progress tracking is one of the newer 
sides of this, uh, but forecasting has been around for a little bit and we can take the schedule again from build and, and kind of break it down, apply budget elements to it, and then forecast uh, over the length of the project what we're going to be spending. And now my final point here is, um, well, cost is cost and my accounting system, my ERP system is that system, right? The, they don't natively talk to each other. Um, but we, there are lots of opportunities for potential integration between those two. And so something that Gray Tech has developed is something called ERP Sync. We're going to have a few slides about this in more detail at the end. Um, but it is meant to help these two systems exchange information. So uh, there's, there can be a dual order, um, dual direction, uh, information sync, right? We can have things being pushed into one software from the other um, so that, you know, what the project managers do is getting pushed back into the uh, ERP system. So it's always up to date. And, um, you know, this is, this is a good thing. So we'll talk a little bit about that later on, um, but it is possible. Just want everybody to be aware of that. I think we have a few polls coming up next. So, uh, Misty, if you could, um, I don't know, do, work your magic uh, on yeah. that side. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So the first poll question is, what is your persona in the construction world? So is that architect designer? Is that engineer, fabricator, owner developer, general contractor, or subcontractor slash vendor? So you can click on either of the selections here right on your screen. And so I know, um, good, we've got some GCs in the house. That's probably the primary um, um, persona right now. But I have a lot of subs who are getting into this um, to track everything. And we, I'm wondering, I'm more curious if any architects or designers are going to be involved. Um, and, you know, again, fabricators, you know, we talk about progress tracking, we talk about, uh, you know, tracking our assets. So do the fabricators need in on this, right? Um, I'm very curious about that. So it looks like we've only got general contractors in the house today. So, um, so then what's our next poll there? We've got four. So hopefully, please be patient. All right. All right. So the next question is, what is your main reason for being here today? So is it because you're not using cost or build and you would like more information? Are you using build, but you want more information on cost? Are you using cost, but you just don't quite understand it fully? Or are you loving cost and you just want more details? All right. So, ooh, 50-50. Okay, so, um, all right, more information on cost. Um, good, good. So hopefully we'll we'll get into there. Oh, not using cost. Um, good. Okay, so we're going to take a, a look at the details. And so if there's anything I don't cover, obviously we can ask that at the end. All right, poll number three. Poll number three, what do you want more information about? Budgets, main contract, SOV, payment apps, cost build, cost contracts, change order workflow, forecasting progress, tracking, or nothing. I'm good. All right, change order workflow. That's, yep, yeah, that's, the, again, the primary <laughs> question I get, even during training. You know, they're like, yeah, we don't care about that. Let's just track our change orders. So we will definitely take a look at that. Um, and right. last what? question here. I'm having fun with these polls, though. <laughs> all right. Uh, what software are you currently using for ERP accounting? CMIC? Viewpoint Vista, Foundation, Coins, Sage, or Other? Oh, I'd be Ooh. interested what the other is. Throw that in the chat. Yeah, yeah. If you've got other, we definitely love to know. This is going to just help us direct our efforts for our ERP sync to see what really is being used out there by everybody. Um, we've got some integrations that work already, 
We've got more in the pipelines based on you know customer demand. So please uh, the, let us know what you are using in the chat. All right. Okay, thanks for that information, everybody. So, demo. Okay, so this is where we are going to kick into um, cost demo, if I can find the right, there we are. So uh, what I was going to do today is start a project from scratch. Now, we're, I'm going to continue that, and then we will set up a budget, and we will set up... Um, um, uh, some contracts and we will take a look at uh, uh, some change order workflows because that was the question. So, all right. So here on uh, our account admin side, I'm going to create a project. Okay. And so I'm going to throw my project in here. We're going to call it uh, cost webinar. Um, that's fine. Project number, if anybody's ever wondered where these project numbers go, they will stick around. They'll show up here in this project list and some other locations, but they don't tie into any other um, functionality in the project. If it needs to be pulled out into documentation, it'll pull it from here. Um, otherwise, it sort of disappears into the background, but it, it's good to put in. Um, project type. So you can look through this list of your projects. And I'm going to go down and find demonstration project. That's all we need today. Um, now, actually, this this is more on the, on the build side of things, but there is something in build called construction IQ. And there are some of these project types that don't support at this point construction IQ. So just I'm just sliding that in there. Um, there's a list out there somewhere. I don't have it at the ready, but um, we have um, we have discovered that there are some project types here that do not support construction IQ. So, including demonstration project. Now, template. This is something I want to um, impress on everybody. Starting a project for build and cost, right? Those templates are tied together. Um, starting a project without a template is a recipe for a lot of extra work. So if you've ever done training with us, we will always start you with at least a sample project that can be turned into a template. And the reason that we will do that, especially more recently as we are learning more about the system and as Autodesk is updating it, there are some settings in cost that can only be added to a template if you start from a project. Why? I don't know. That's the way it works. We know this now. And so ideally, we start a project, the, just a sample project. You set all your settings up in there. We turn that project into a template, and then we can use it going forwards. So I am going to grab my, uh, my typical template here. Address, time zone, all of these things are useful for your home pages. It'll show you the correct weather. It will make sure that you're getting updates relative to your time zone. And of course, you know, we always want a start and end date for a given project. So we'll make this one be about a year long. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. $123 million project. And I was going to pop this into Canadian just because um, I'm down here in the Southern Ontario. Um, and apparently I don't know my alphabet. <laughs> there we go. All right. So I'm going to create this project. Um, so we're going to let it start getting set up here. So on the member side, uh, I'm going to select myself a role. Um, no, I'm not a landscape architect. I was going to go with a BIM manager. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about roles. People that you add to the project can have multiple roles. So you're going to have maybe, you know, five different subcontractors. They all may have the role of, you know, um, specific um, people as well as they like they might be an engineer or they might be a landscape architect or they might be someone very specific that you will have created for a role for but then in terms of permissions they might also just be generally grouped under something like a subcontractor so that you can add subcontractors to a permission setting with 
um, you know, generically, but when you want to get more granular and send individuals, you want to send the engineer a notification, it doesn't go to all of your subcontractors. So put, giving people multiple roles can benefit you later on uh, as far as breaking down what you, what controls their abilities in the, in the, um, the system. So here I'm going to turn on, um, I'm just going to turn on docs and build and cost management here. And I want to call your attention to in the cost management area here, it says view all tool permissions. So once you turn cost management on, I'm not going to click on this just yet, but I will go there eventually. There is a shortcut here to jump to your member permissions related to whoever's in this project. Um, and you could control a group of people, like all of your subcontractors, and what they can see. These permissions I have built into our project template so that I don't have to worry about them every time. And I know that everybody assigned a project subcontractor role is going to be um, attached to my project, my subcontractor um, permission settings later on. So there's a lot you want to do in the early stages to get this set up. All right. So now I'm going to refresh this list because it looks like I'm the only member, but there are actually a number of other members in here that were part of my project template again. So if you've got consistent vendors you work with or just team members you want in there on every project, they can be assigned automatically. So all I had to do was refresh there and you can see everybody here. So here's my subcontractor. Um, I'm actually going to make them a landscape architect, um, not an MEP, a little closer to my heart. And these, this person is just a project member. They're going to have access to cost, and I will show you their, their permissions as a subcontractor. So their role is landscape architector, but I also want them to be a subcontractor. All right, and I'm going to leave the rest of these people. Let's see. Uh, I was going to make Eric um, document manager and, and so on. All right, and I think I needed somebody in here to be my general contractor. All right, maybe I don't have one in here. Um, that's what I was going to do. Vandalay. All right. He's going to be my Vandalay contractors. Perfect. So you're going to assign everybody a company based on companies um, set up within your system. Now, often that takes place on the build side, but if you are not using build or you haven't maybe added everybody, um, this is something that can come through an ERP integration. So those companies, those vendors can be pushed from your system into build. Um, or we set them up here and we can push it the other direction. So a lot of information can go wherever you're going to set it up first or have a more organized list first. All right, so we've got our uh, admin side of things set up. Now, if I go to settings here, these aren't the settings I want. I want cost specific settings, but just so you know, there is a shortcut to some of your different product settings from here. So I can just go to settings here and I can go to cost. Now it does open a new tab. I hope everybody's got their own tab browser for this, um, but it's gonna take me to my cost settings, which is where I need to go next anyways. So we'll let this run through um, just setting up that project. It's gonna be a second. And where do I wanna talk about now? Um, this is also where we can save as a template. So if there are any settings in here, we, once we've set this up, we can save as template from here. There's a lot more work I need to do before this is template ready though, if this were a template project. So once this is set up, it's going to start us either in the settings because that's where I clicked to jump in here, or it's going to start me in the budget area but basically the budget area is going to tell me that I have to go to settings first. So that's where we will head immediately after it finishes setting up this project. And while it's setting up, maybe I'll show you settings that I already have open from um, my project template. 
So all settings and cost, um, well, settings and cost are basically cost. If you don't get into the settings and, you know, set them up first, we really can't do a lot of useful um work in cost because a lot of it depends on company uh, setup, uh, budget code, master lists. Uh, and here we go. Okay. I'm back in our, our actual project and we have to start that first. 99% of these settings are set up in a project template. So that is a good thing. There is one key element in our brand new project that we have to set up every time we start a project because we just you know, can't in a template and that's our company setup. So we're going to quick jump into company setup and we're going to decide who is the owner on this project. So I was going to go with uh, Great Tech Canada. Who's our main contractor? Well, we're going to go Seinfeld here. We're going to say Vandalay Contractors and you're going to want a contact for all of these. And Architect and notary are a little more optional, although there are more roles for architect now going forwards in cost. As of a January release, we've got a lot of information in here. So um, that's what I forgot to do. That's okay. We'll make them a civil architect. That doesn't work. Um, and so we can add people and I will add one of my aliases there. So we're going to set up our architect it is not necessary, but owner and contractor are. You can't really go forwards with the rest of your settings until you have these set up. You will get stuck. It will tell you you can't issue or you know send documents until that's set up. So now that we have our company set up, I'm going to just pop over into the budget and the budget code format to show you what we have set up here. But ideally, this is set up ahead of time. So our budget codes, when we go into our budget and we upload the document shortly, it's going to be a project number. Uh, first, six-digit project number. Then we're going to have a CSI code, also six digits. Okay, we've got a fully, every potential CSI code that we might want should be in here. And we also have a category here, just the three-letter quick category at the end. So your project number or your, sorry, your cost code is basically going to look something like this, right? Project number, CSI number, um, category. Now these, we can have as many or as few as you want. I have people that are working with seven different segments. Wow. Uh, and I have people who are working with just one. So this is completely customizable. This is probably the first thing you guys should start talking about internally if you guys are looking at cost. Figure out your budget codes, get them cleaned up, and we get them into this master list here. The master list gets put into your project template and allows us then to just project to project come in and upload a budget. So here we are on the budget side. Um, nothing is visible. Nothing comes in on the budget side with a template. Um, and I'm going to go to edit mode. There are two ways to get a budget in here. We're going to hit the add button and I'm going to manually fill out information, right? 4159, there's my project number. I can grab information from here and it will build me a line item in my budget, right? I go through, I fill out my quantity, my unit cost and my amount. That is basically what we're already doing in Excel. So you could do it here and forget about the Excel piece. This is definitely an option, although it is not the option I'm going to work on today. So I'm going to delete that. I'm going to import um, a budget from already set up uh, data and I can drag and drop here. And of course it's not going to work. It worked before, but now it's going to change its mind. Um, let's see what I have here. We're going to save that and we're going to try it again. Of course, of course. Let me double check my budget code format here. So, oh, I know. I did change something previous to this. I have a hyphen in between all of my categories and I had left it out here. So I think that's going to be my issue. Let's import that again. There we go. 
quick fix, import, something to change on your template. Your templates are always living documents, so things will need to be tweaked as you work through projects. So don't feel that you're ever going to have this finalized absolutes in cement, um, you know, project template. Okay, so I imported my budget there. A couple of quick, once it once it's formatted correctly, a couple of quick dones, and you have a full budget list here, right? Everything is filled out. If there are zeros, because maybe when you uploaded this budget, you didn't know what they were going to be, we can go in and we can decide, you know, how much time we're going to need for all of these people, um, you know, on the project. And we'll just pop a bunch of values in here so we can have um, a proper budget. Okay, so you can edit it after the fact or have it completely filled out when you are uploading it. And I want to call attention as I scroll down. I've got a couple of items with sub items here. So I've got a main concrete substructure uh, line item. It's got a total value. But I also have all of these sub items here. These sub items basically make up this total value. Now, I don't have it everywhere. Some line items are just one line item, and I've chosen not to show those sub items. Um, when I build sub items like this into my budget, I am currently in edit mode. This is this is my full full visibility edit mode. When I uncheck edit mode or unclick that and I see my budget, uh, those are in the threes, I do not have access to those. So if you have project members in here who do not have access to edit the budget, they will not see those line items, those sub items. So a big discussion I always have with people is whether or not they will have an entirely flat budget. So those, those sub items will end up getting pulled out into main items or not. This is really important to people and it just speaks to how they're going to structure the whole budget and what you can and cannot see. Okay, so now uh, we've got our budget. We're going to talk about a main contract. I have to set this stuff up before I do anything else. Unless for some reason you aren't using a budget, you're only using contracts to track change orders. I have done that before, but that isn't really the way it's supposed to work. But um, so in our main contract, again, I have this edit mode area and before I can bring my budget items in, I'm going to hit the add button and I'm going to call this, you know, prime contract zero one. And I'm going to just call it prime. This is the physical uh, collection of items that will be the prime contract schedule of values. I have statuses that I can put it in right now. It's draft. So I'm going to leave that blank and I will pick an ultimate type of contract that I am about to create. And again, there are a couple of different ways to get your budget into your main contract. If your budget is going to be transported into your contract as is, almost or all of the line items in your budget are gonna be listed here in your main, great. We have a very straightforward uh, option there to select all of them, or let's say you leave out the internal stuff, right? We can deselect items and we can hit create main contract schedule of values. And it will bring everything that is checked over into the main contract as is. That's what I'm going to show you long term. I just want to show you how we would do it a little more manually if we did not want our entire, you know, 700 budget line items in our um, main contract. So underneath my prime, I can have more than one main contract in here. If you've got a subs and a general, if you've got multiple contracts, you can have them, which might be why we need to break out our budget. So here I'm going to either add sub item manually and type in, you know, another item. This is, these are my internal costs or these are my subcontractors. This is, oh, I always put my description in the code button and I will write it again here. And I can say, you know, SC01, right? We can name this as much as we want. And I can put in a unit cost. I can put in an amount here. And then I will associate it to a budget. 
If I do it this way right now, I can only associate it to one budget at a time. So if this were all of my subcontractor costs at one time, I can't just click my budget code and drop down. I'm going to go here and I'm going to say batch associate budgets. And this will allow me to pick multiple budget items from a list, associate them to this category, whatever it's called that I have named. And if I'm going to do this, we may want to preserve main contract value. So let's say you bought all these contracts out at a price of, you know, $7 million, but really their total of all of them is like six and a half million. I want my 7 million that I've maybe typed in here to hold knowing that I'm going to make, you know, 500,000 on that. So I don't want the totals of these budgets to become my unit cost or my, my total value here. I'm going to preserve my main contract value of whatever I want to type in. Okay. So this is a way to associate, to make your own categories in your main contract and then associate all of those sub items with it. And what it will do is it will actually break down that, um, the main, the, the value that I put in here, let's see, I don't know if that's, yeah, 4 million. It will automatically break down whatever you had potentially typed in in your budget for these, and it will kind of renegotiate that. And it'll, in my case, um, it broke them down evenly. If I had set this up before, it would have taken a percentage of what they originally were and broken them down by that. So really it just summarizes all up into your agreed on amount with whoever is upstream of you. Okay. So this is one option. So that's a little bit more involved, um, but it is very organized, right? It's it's very meticulous that you can you can really structure it how you want. The last thing we can do here, and, and the last thing, the first thing that I'm going to go back to though, and how I'm going to structure this is I'm going to grab everything. I'm going to create a main contract. I'm going to assign it all to the prime. I'm going to create budget groups based on. What do I want to group this by? Do I want to see it grouped by CSI? Probably not on my main contract. So I'm going to go with category here. And I like to click this one. Otherwise, I have too many plus signs. So I'm going to hit create. And I'm going to, I'm going to get all of my different categories here. And I can see them now on my main line item, or I can break them down. And all of these categories and costs are going to be accurate. There's no preserving any magical values that I've typed in, typed in here. And then if I realize I've added too many, like maybe my internal costs, they're not going to go on my main contract. I can just grab something and delete a group of items if I don't need them here. Okay. So this is the setup of our main contract and our budget. Um, I'm going to leave out payment applications for right now because uh, I'm going to try and get to our change order workflow. Um, so in order to really work on a, so, some of the change orders, right, some of the change orders are going to um, affect budget items only. Some of them are going to affect both budget and contract items or cost items. So I want to get at least one or two uh, contracts, subcontracts, contracts, vendor contracts, whatever you want to call these. This is normally where I handle those other contracts, those downstream contracts from me. Now I can do that from the budget area. So if I have, you know, my, my subcontract there, my substructure, I can grab these two items and I can say allocate to a contract. If I've built contracts already, I can allocate to an existing or I can hit create new. I can let those contract codes be dictated by my budget codes. Or I could go in there and I could just say all concrete 01, right? All concrete 02. And again, leave those contract names, merge them, you know, rename them to whatever I want. And I'm going to hit create. Now I have two contracts set up here. And um, I'm going to click on this contract and we're going to make this contract, we're going to push this contract through. Uh, a workflow so that it leaves the draft and it becomes a, an executed contract. And then I'm going to be able to um, 
start tracking change orders to it. So I'm going to, anytime you see this blue text, you want to click in here and it's going to open a flyout. You can do this in contract, budget, everywhere. And the really important information is usually up top, right? We're going to make sure this is our prime contract. We have a budget attached to it. What type uh, is this going to be? Is this a subcontractor? Is this a consultant? I can make new types in my contract and I'm going to want to attach this to um, a company, right? A vendor for this. So uh, I don't have a, the appropriate contract vendor in here. So I'm going to attach it to, uh, you know, maybe this is Vandalay Contractors again. All right. So we're going to attach it to uh, that guy. I can enter a scope of work here. Um, I have a um, an SOV for my subcontract, and you can see that it is pulling in all of that information that I actually had in my budget. When you create your contract like this, it will pull in those sub items if there were any. So this is what you, let's say, have received from, or this is what you're budgeting for. And when we um, request supplier input, when this goes out to my subcontractor, this is going to, um, they're going to have the chance to review all of this information and send it back to you. So I'm going to just set as pending supplier input. I'm not going to have this send a million emails to my coworker. It's going to set as submitted. Um, and on the other end, it is requiring documentation. So I've got some compliance requirements set up here, which is our important. Um, we can upload some of these documents from um, our computer here. I've got a lien waiver. I'm just going to upload my lien waiver three times because I don't have a sample document for all of these compliance requirements right now. But the goal of these requ compliance requirements is that a document is uploaded and satisfies ideally that criteria. The document is not read or managed, but a document is required. Okay. So it's attaching those to my documents as attachments. And generally I can generate or I want to generate a cost document, right? When I get enter into a contract with somebody, whether it's my main contract or a subcontract, I'm going to generate them, right? It's got to go out for signatures and review. I'm going to generate a document package. Um, and so we're going to have that generated up here. And so these are all green at this point, my subcontractor having uploaded all of those information will be able to submit this to back to us. So I'm acting as both. So they have technically added those. I'm going to set as submitted and we're going to send this off for official um, signatures and set as executed when they come back signed. So I now have uh, a contact, uh, sorry, a contract in here. And we can now, we can take a look at our change orders from both sides of things. So PCO, this gets some pushback from contractors or everybody in the system. This is a change event. This isn't a PCO yet. I've got a lot of, I don't know, resistance on this. The way that Autodesk treats a PCO is it is a thing that may cost you money in the future. The PCO doesn't go anywhere. The PCO holds on to that information. It is where the RFI gets put. It is where the issue gets pushed. It is where the meeting request gets pushed and the meeting issue gets pushed from build into this PCO. And it is where all of my... Um, change order workflow starts. I cannot do anything directly into any of these other tabs. So I'm going to add a, a change order here. So name, um, the thing that needs to change. There's my, it'll automatically number it based on settings you have defined. And looking at this, I can choose in scope. That's going to be a cost or contract change only. Budget only change, only affecting a budget item. Out of scope will allow me to do both budget and cost changes and say, well, so will contingency. So I'm going to click on out of scope. And at this point, there's 
there's not much to do with it. Everything's in draft, but in order to go forwards, I really need a cost item. What is going to cost me the money on this? So the thing that costs is going to be attached to that. And that thing that costs gets attached to a budget item or a new budget item, right? If it doesn't exist already, if this is a whole new thing you didn't budget for. All right. So we're going to just say uh, sundry materials, right? This is a bunch of stuff we forgot to buy. I can attach it to um, a contract. This budget isn't associated with a contract. So right now, if I work through this, I only have budget change information. So that's going to be um, a change order request and an owner change order, right? Those are upstream changes. If let's say I attached this to um, it was my substructure concrete that I had that one. This now has a contract attached to it. And so I will be able to make my request for quotation from my subs and my supplier contractor change order, supplier change order, and my budget, my upstream and my downstream. Okay, so if you're if you're wondering what's gone on in the past, this is what you have to make sure you understand about these. Okay, budget and cost means it needs a budget item and a contract. So we've got all of that set it up here. And at the PCO stage, I can enter an estimated cost. Like, oh God, I hope this is only going to cost me 5,000 bucks. Now, as I work through this, I can set as open, right? Now, as I set as open, other people on my team will be allowed to see that. Drafts are, are personal. And I now have budget and cost information to push through. So I can go budget change and I can generate a change order request. Or I can jump right to an owner change order if I don't use my change order requests. And same with on the cost side. I can generate the RFQ if I use it. Or I can jump right to an SEO if I don't. If you are not using the RFQs and the CORs, you can disable those in your settings. So they are not a tab that you need to worry about. They will not show up here. That's an important thing to discuss. Figure out what you're using and get rid of it if you do not need it. And finally, if I need any documentation here, I'm going to click on my blue text and I'm going to create my document package. My, my Basically, my PCO information that I might have written up at the time that this might have cost me money. And then when I need to generate these future documentations, I can pull this in if I need to. Man time flies in these webinars. All right. So I'm going to generate, I'm going to jump right to the OCO stage. I'm going to generate an owner change order. And actually, sorry, I have jumped too far. I'm going to generate first, I got to go downstream. I got to figure out what this is going to cost me reality. I need my uh, supplier to tell me what this is costing me. So the supplier is going to come back and they're going to say, actually, you know, it's only 4,800. Yay. Oh, not 45,000, uh, 4,800. So great, I'm going to save 200 bucks. So that's my estimate. I'm going to generate my supplier change order. Great. So I now have a few values in here. So as I would go through, right, if I were to do a propose and submitted, those would come from my RFQ and COR, right? Those are the early phases. Since I jumped, I'm going into straight into committed. Um, what am I missing here? I am missing a type and a scope of work. Why am I missing those? Why is it not letting me go forwards? I set up a contract requirement that says in my tem template, you have to tell me what kind of um, change this is. Okay. And I need uh, at least some info in here. So I have to have a value there before I can open up this as, a, as a, an SEO and before I can send this anywhere else. So I've sent it out to my supplier. They're going to review it. They're going to assign it. They're going to call me and they say, nope. And then when they say yes, we are going to execute it. Now that that's been executed, um, I can actually go back to my PCO and I'm going to execute 
my budget change. So now that I know how much it's really going to cost me, I can generate uh, my upstream changer. Okay, so I have been approved for, you know, maybe I'm going to generate this and I'm going to still go with $5,000 because um, that 200 bucks is, you know, overhead. So I'm going to generate this and I can add markups to this. So again, that 200 bucks, maybe I left it at 4,800, but then I added my fee on fee. Um, and so we can see these markup, this, this bit of markup on there as well. Okay. Now I'm going to, oh, I need some information. So I'm going to throw in a type that was an internal change and some info here. And I should be able to, oh, what am I missing? Oh, submitted. I need a submitted value here. Where is that submitted? So I can copy this from estimated, approved, or committed. So I'm going to go with copying that from approved. That's my biggest value there. I'm going to recalculate my markups. That's what that um, exclamation mark is. And I'm going to following field is required. I have a submitted field. <laughs> what is it uh, talking about? So let me just review if there's so uh, I need a date. There we go. That's what it is. There we go. Now I can set as open East cost item much must link to a budget uh it does ah my um my markup fees they need to link to a budget as well set as open all right and now i can submit this and run it through whoever needs to look at it and finally get it approved now we've got five minutes left. So I'm going to keep in mind uh, the fact that you want more information. And so if we're going to be generating some more webinars and content for you, uh, we're going to keep this change order request in mind. And so maybe we can uh, follow up with you if you've got some questions um, and push out more detailed information on the change orders or specific questions. Um, but we're going to have to wrap, start to wrap things up. And I do want to just briefly talk about um, uh, our ERP sync that I mentioned at the beginning. So we, um, you know, there are companies that will help you sync right now, sync your data between them. Um, we saw some holes in those uh, workflows and we thought we should, Bring something that was a little more we could really be hands-on and help you with that information getting uh, exactly what you need from system to system so um, you know a lot of people see um, the value in build right the this single source of truth is all coming together in the system right we have um, all of our data stored in the same place, the build, the cost, the design, it's all coming together so that we're all looking at the same issues list. We're not emailing the latest back and forth because somebody was working on last week's. There's still information that isn't quite connected. Um, and so we don't want to have to duplicate data entry. We, I don't want to have to get something from here and punch it into somewhere else. Transferring information, giving, you know, accounting a PDF that I printed from what I did today and having them not get to it yet. And then things are inaccurate. So we're looking at synchronizing that information. So we've got um, a fairly straightforward that that was also our goal is making a very user friendly system, something that we can help you integrate, but that you can carry on working on and managing by yourself um, between cost and your ERP or accounting software. Um, so we've got build on one side, we've got your uh, software on the other side, and we are looking to get uh, just this is a uh, Typical information, right? We need the vendors from your system 
to get them into build. Why would I build them twice? They need to be the same information in order for the two systems to talk about them in the same language, right? And so we can then, once you've got your build vendors in, we can assign contracts to those vendors. So the contracts can be built in build because that's what it's meant to do. That information then can be pulled back into your system in placed in the appropriate columns, right? So we're basically acting as a translator um, with this, this uh, ERP sync, getting this information back and forth where it needs to be, where it is the most important, it'll get developed, and then it'll get pushed into the other system as needed. Um, you know, it's we're just hoping for improving workflows and collaboration. Again, Mark mentioned way at the beginning, everything has a cost implementation. Now you've got me doing it, Mark. Uh, a cost um, implication. Um, and we really just want to get everybody on the same page and understanding the same information. So um, I thought I had another ERP slide, but I guess thank you. I think that's almost one minute to spare. So if anybody's got any questions about anything, um, I think at this point, 